Amen. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, super. I'm listening to this chapter, and there's so much uh, great doctrine in Matthew chapter 7. Um, we're going to focus on one specific um, part of Matthew chapter 7. But what are we talking about this evening? We're starting a new series uh, tonight. We're talking, looking at salvation roadblocks. What we're looking at is, is, what is what are some things that are common out there amongst people that we run into today, amongst people in, especially in Fresno, in America, what is keeping people from believing the gospel? What are some common things that people believe that are causing them to not be saved? That's what we're looking at in this sermon series. Now, look down at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. A lot of people, tonight we're going to look at the number one cause. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people claim the name of Jesus today. A lot of people claim to believe in Jesus. They claim that they know who Jesus was. They believe Jesus was God. A lot of people claim this today, but it's always been this way. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, if you look back at actually verse number 13, let's look there first. Most of Matthew chapter 7, if you have a red letter Bible, by the way, the words are red. That means this is Jesus talking. Okay, this is Jesus himself. If you look back at Matthew chapter 7, Look at verse 13. Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Jesus here is responding to a question that one of the disciples asked him earlier, saying, Are there few that be saved? The disciples asked Jesus at one time, Are there few that be saved? I mean, are most people saved? Or are most people not saved? And as I showed you this morning, God wants, it's God's will that most people, that all people would be saved. But that's just simply not reality. The reality is, is that most people are not saved. Tonight, we're going to look at the number one roadblock that keeps people from being saved. And that is the belief in works-based salvation. The belief that you must work your way to heaven, that you must do things yourself to earn your own righteousness. This is the number one thing, especially if you become a soul winner. This is, this is what everybody is hung up on, is works-based salvation. Look down at Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. A lot of people, as I said, a lot of people claim the name of Jesus. If you talk to probably 50, 60 percent of people, I don't know what the percentage is now, but I would guess um, being a soul winner, somebody that knocks doors every single week, I would guess that it's 50, 60 percent of people, maybe more, that they claim the name of Jesus. But the Bible says, Jesus himself says, that straight is the gate, meaning narrow, not straight like an arrow, straight, S-T-A-I, S-T-R-I, I'm an engineer, I've never known how to spell, okay, S-T-R-A-I-T, not straight as an arrow. Okay, straight is the gate, like the Straits of Hormuz, like a narrow passageway. That is, the, that is the path that leads to life. But why? But why? It's a gift. It's not hard to get a gift. It's not hard to trust on Jesus. It's not hard to receive something that's free, but it is something that is difficult for most people to do because they can't take the trust off themselves and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but a lot of people claim the name of Jesus. So what gives? Jesus explains this in Matthew chapter 7. Look down at verse number 21. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. We're looking at works tonight. We're looking at the, the stumbling block of works-based salvation tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. These are red words in your Bible. This is Jesus Christ talking. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. These people are calling Jesus Lord. That is the first point I need to make here. These people, and Jesus is saying, not everybody that calls me Lord, look, they're acknowledging that he is God. They're acknowledging that he is the Savior. They're acknowledging that. They're saying, not everyone that, he says, not everyone that says on me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What's the will of the Father? That everyone would believe on the Son. John 6, 40. Verse number 22. He goes into further detail. He says, many will say to me in that day. This is the day, this is the moment where they have died and they are standing in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Look at verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These people are going to hell right here. They call Jesus Lord. They're standing in front of Jesus. And he says, I never knew you. Notice, notice, and we'll talk about eternal security in a few minutes, but notice how he doesn't say, I used to know you, and then I forgot you. He says, I never knew you. Because what are these people trusting in? Look back up at verse number 22. When Jesus asked them and they stand in front of Jesus, what are they trusting in? What do they say? They say, look at all the wonderful works that we have done. And Jesus at that point will say, I never knew you. Look, folks, there's going to be a lot of people that are very surprised in that day. There's going to be a lot of people that claim the name of Jesus that are very, they're going to be very surprised in that day. Look, James 2.19 says, even the, even the devils, even the devils, turn to James chapter 2. Turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and look at verse number 19. James chapter 2, look at verse number 19. Even the devils believe that there is one God. James 2.19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Look, it is, it is not about believing that there's one God, even believing Jesus is that God, and then trusting in your own works. That's these people in Matthew chapter 7. The problem is works and what they were trusting in in Matthew chapter 7. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. You say, what's the problem? You say, what's the problem? I mean, these people were doing, they were wonderful works. They're casting out devils. Look, that's a good thing to do. Devils are bad. You know, they're doing, they're prophesying in Jesus' name. The problem is, is that he never knew them, okay? Look, it's all about, when it comes to salvation, it's all about whether or not, it's not whether you claim Jesus, it's whether he claims you. It's whether he knows you or not. And these people he did not know. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved. That means saved from hell, folks. For by grace are ye saved through wonderful works. No, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is, they, it is the gift of God. And then, just to make sure we get it, I love verse number 9. Just to make sure we get it, he says it again. Not of works. I mean, there's, there's probably the simplest verse in the entire Bible right there. You are saved not of works, lest any man should boast. That, that is two of the simplest verses in the entire Bible. At this point... We could pray, start the grill, and have a good time. All right, but here's the problem. Why are so many people hung up on this? Why are people, I mean, look, the, the, the Catholic Church is just straight up works. You know, it's just straight up, they just preach works. I mean, it's just Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, that proves that wrong right there. Very simple. The problem, though, is when you get into the Protestants and, you know, all these different denominations of the Reformation is that, what you get into is this veiled works theology. It's not right out in front like the Catholics. You just must do these things. You must do the sacraments. You must confess your sins to a priest. You must go to Mass this, time, uh, this many times a week or whatever it is. It's, it's veiled works. But it's works all the same. It's works-based salvation all the same. That's why I've always said that the Reformation, everyone thinks that the Reformation was so great. No, the Reformation was the devil's plan B. The Catholic Church was simply getting too stupid, too far away from the Bible, where they're selling indulgences, they're saying you can buy your relatives out of hell, all these things that are just not in the Bible at all, and they're trying to get rid of all the Bibles, and they're trying to persecute people that have Bibles or that are translating Bibles. They just couldn't get them all. Finally, you know, the Reformation happens, and you get this, this veiled works-based theology that pops out of this. All right? The Reformation, was, it's, it's just as wicked. It's just a veiled works-based theology. And it's really got some people wrapped around the axle out there. So that's what I want to give you. I want to give you some Bible verses. I want to give you some doctrine tonight to where if you have somebody that's confused on these doctrines, that's confused on this, this works-based intertwined theology that just trying to put works into salvation, 
you'll have some horsepower to get people beyond this so they can actually get saved. Right? The Bible says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Another very simple verse. Believeth on meaning trust, as Ephesians chapter 1 says. Hey, when you trust in Jesus, you hath it. It's done. And it's what? And it's life that lasts for five years. No, it's everlasting. It's eternal, the Bible says. Everlasting, everlasting, eternal, eternal, eternal. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's done. It's over at that point. Works has nothing to do with it. So the first one I want to kind of come after is this veiled works. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Is this idea of belief plus works. Like I have to believe on Jesus, but I also have to do the works to go to heaven, to be saved. Okay, don't get me wrong, folks. We preach against, we preach the whole Bible here. I just, I stand up here and I scream Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I scream against sin. I preach everything that the Bible says. But look, getting, getting good works into your life has nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven. Nothing. Not even a little bit. So this whole idea of, well, you got to believe, but you got to do the works too. Look, it's, it's false doctrine. It's false doctrine. Turn to Romans chapter 11. You say, why does it matter? You know, why does it matter? You know, I've had, I've had Protestants, I've had Lutherans tell me, you know, why, why do you Baptists, why do you Baptists have to make, have to make salvation so narrow? It's like, were those my red words in the Bible? This is Jesus said, straight is the gate. Look, it's people making salvation narrow. Salvation is easy, my friends. It's easy. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Turn to Romans, and you know, you know, when I was a Protestant, before I was saved, let me just say this, I never thought Baptists were unsaved. So the Baptists, you know, the, the Lutherans and the Protestants will look at the Baptists. Look, what's a Baptist? When, you, when the Bible is your boss, you're a Baptist. That's it. That's what a Baptist is. When you believe everything in the Bible and nothing outside the Bible, we don't have any extra biblical doctrine here. I don't stand up here and read commentaries to you. If it's in the Bible, that's what gets preached here. If it's not, it doesn't. It's very simple. It's very simple. So look, turn to Romans chapter 11. Why can't works be intertwined? Why, why can't it be both? Why? Because the Bible. That's why. First of all, logic. The Bible is very logical. Okay? The Bible matches a person's logic. God didn't write a, a book that didn't match what he, puts in, what he put in our hearts in Romans 2.15. Look at Romans chapter 11. Look at verse number 5. The Bible points this out many times that it cannot be both. It cannot be works-based salvation and grace. Look at verse number 5 of Romans chapter 11. The Bible says, even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the, according to the election of what? Of grace. Remember, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is they, the gift of God. Look at verse number 6 of Romans chapter 11. And if by grace, so Paul says this, it's a, it's a rhetorical question because we know it's by grace in Ephesians chapter 2. Then, look at this, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Then he says it the other way. So we, there's no possible way you could misunderstand this. Then he says, but if it be of works, then it of no more grace. He's saying, it's either grace or it's works. Pick one. Because if it's by grace, I mean, think about it. Just think of the logic of it, folks. Think of the logic of it. It's like, if it's by grace, you're like, it's by grace, but I also want, it, it's a free gift, but I also want to pay for it. It makes no sense. You know, somebody gives you a gift, and let me pay you for that free gift. It makes no sense. So if it's by grace, it can't be of works, just logically. The Bible's telling us that. But if it's by work, look, if it's by works, look at, think of it the other way. He says it the other way, too. If it's by works, then guess what? You earned it. You earned it. It wasn't free. You paid for it, whether through work or whatever. But the Bible tells us that it's only grace. It can only be grace, not works. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. There's tons of Bible on this. But it's a very simple concept. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. And we'll look at verse number 21. You cannot intertwine works with grace, or it's not grace. 
the Bible says. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. I mean, think about this. Look at Galatians 2.21. I mean, this is the huge, I mean, why would somebody, why would somebody come to the earth, suffer and die for humankind if they didn't have to? Why would somebody go through the terrible, you know, life, death, the soul going to hell, resurrection from the dead, if, if it didn't, if it wasn't necessary? Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. That's called frustrating the grace of God, Paul says. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For it's right, if righteousness come by the law, meaning if I can be good enough, if I can be good enough to get myself to heaven, this is, this is what he's saying. He's saying, then Christ is dead in vain. is unnecessary. If I can be good enough, or you can be good enough, to get yourself to heaven through the works of the law, Jesus is, is altogether unnecessary. That's what the Bible is saying. Turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 3. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 3. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 3 the Bible says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. What, were the, what was the problem with the Jews at this time? They thought that they were righteous through the law. And what Paul is saying here is, look, I mean, seriously, there's, there's, according to the Bible, there's two ways to heaven. Keep the whole law, that's the first one, which we're all toast, for, for all have sinned. For all have sinned. We've already broken the law. We've already broken the law, so nobody can do that one. Or trust on Jesus Christ. Those are the two ways. And only one is possible for us. Look at verse number four. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You better be perfect. No, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. That just means that you don't get grace. He's saying if you think that, if you, think that you can keep the law, you're going to have nothing but debt. That's it. You're going to owe because you haven't kept the whole law. Look, you may do all kinds of great things over here, but that doesn't take away the law that you have broken over here. And we've all broken God's law. That's the definition of a sin, is the transgression of the law. Go back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I should have had you keep your place there. But go back to Matthew chapter 7. Look, folks, everything in the Bible matches our logic that we have. It makes no sense that works could be intertwined with grace because it, it wouldn't be grace. Look at Matthew 7, 22. The Bible says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works. Here's another reason why God would never have salvation be even a little bit by your works. Why? What are these people doing here? What are these people doing as they stand in front of Jesus Christ, and, and what are they doing? Are they saying, thank you, Jesus Christ, for dying for me? Are they saying, thank you, God, for sending your son to live a perfect life and take the sacrifice for my sins? Thank you. I'm a poor, miserable sinner. Thank you for doing that for me. I deserve nothing but hell. Is that what they're saying? No, they're saying, look how great we are. They're saying, what are they doing? They're boasting. They're boasting. As, it, as it, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, God says we would do. Not of works. Why? Why is it not of works? lest any man should boast. Because God knew if he even let it be even part of your works, you'd just sit up there and you'd say, look at me. Look at how great I am. And, the, and, his, and his own son's death would be in vain. What would be the point of that? We would just boast about it. Turn to Isaiah chapter 64. God literally tells us why he designed salvation this way. Why? Because you all will brag about it if I don't do it for you, is what he says. I mean, you could claim credit. You could claim credit. Look at Isaiah chapter 64. But, but what it is when people do try to mix works in, to, in with grace, what they're doing is they're claiming credit for something that they had nothing to do with. And in Isaiah chapter 64, verse number 6, we see how God feels about that. Look at verse number 6 of Isaiah 64. 
but we are all as an unclean thing. We're all sinners, folks. And all our righteousness, you know what that means? All the good that you do, all the good that you do, this is what it means for your salvation. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. And all we do will fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You know what that's saying? It's like, when it comes to your salvation, it's your iniquities that's the problem. It's like all your good, all the good things that you've done, it's like filthy rags. It's like walking, it's a, we're, we're going to go to the Clovis Farmer's Market the other day. And it's like walking up to some guy at the booth at the farmer's market and grabbing a bunch of fruit and nuts and all these things. And he come to pay, and you know, I just give him a pile of filthy rags from my garage. I'm like, here you go. How's that going to work? It's not going to work. That's mixing works with salvation right there. It's it, our, our works, their ability. Look, look, good works are good things to do. Don't get me wrong. This is what we are supposed to do. It is our reasonable service, as Pastor Mejia said a week ago. But trying to buy your salvation with your good works, they're filthy rags. Payment not accepted. Look, every single, this, every single religious unsaved person believes a version of what I'm talking about right now. And guess what? All those people all those religious people that are relying on their works to get themselves to heaven, they all think they're pretty good. They all think that they're good people. But guess what? Put yourself in God's shoes here. I know that's, that's impossible for us to do, but let's just, just think about this for a second. Just think about doing something great. Think about, just think about any analogy that I could make here is not good enough. Think about doing something great for someone. Think about you have a, a great friend, someone that you love, and you just like, they're struggling, and you, they're struggling, and they don't have any money, and you, and they don't have a way to get to work, and you like, you give them a car. You're like, here's a car, brother. And you just give them a car. And you say, here you go. I mean, that's, that's a big gift, a car. And then this person, they take the car, and, and they go around, and and they, they, come, they come in and they, they're around all their friends and your friends and they're saying, well, you know, everyone's like, that's a great car. That's a great car that you have. And they say, well, I have this car because I work hard and, and God has blessed me and, and I have this car. And, and if you work, if you're like me, you could have a nice car too. And you're standing there and you've just given them the car. Wouldn't that be irritating? It's a small analogy. But think about us. Think about God sending his own son to do what he did. Only God could do it. Only God could live a perfect life and die and be an acceptable sacrifice. No matter how much I like any of you, I cannot die for your sins. Because I am a sinner, I am not innocent. God does this. He does it successfully. He suffers and he dies and that payment is accepted and then we claim credit? No, I don't think so. It's never going to work that way. Anybody claiming the name of Jesus that believes this, they're on their way to hell. Unless they understand what the Bible says, that they must take all of their trust and they must believe on Jesus Christ. They must put all their belief on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, folks, we exist for His glory. There is nothing that we are here for for our own glory. We exist only for the glory of God. Anything that we're doing for our own glory is wrong, and we don't want to be wrong on salvation. How about this one? Turn to Jonah 3.10. Or just look at the front of your bulletin. Jonah 3.10, an extremely powerful soul-winning verse. Jonah 3.10, we looked at God changing his mind this morning. How about this one? You have to, yes, you have to believe on Jesus, but then you have to turn from your sins. Or you have, to, you have to repent of your sins. People will teach. But guess what? This is veiled works. Look, folks, turning from your sins is good. Repenting or changing your mind about your sin and getting out of sin is good. Again, that's why I stand up here and I yell and I holler and scream three times a week. But it's not for salvation. It has nothing to do 
with you being saved by turning from your sin. Look at Jonah 3.10. Look what it, I'll prove it to you. First of all, the phrase repent of your sins never occurs in the Bible. It's made up. There is nowhere in the Bible, first of all, it doesn't even say repent of your sins in the Bible. The closest verse that has anyone repenting from their sin is Jonah 3.10. And it has nothing to do with salvation. It's just people just getting right with God. It's just about a nation, a city, getting right with God. Look at verse number 10. And God saw their works. But isn't this interesting? What are their works? What are their works? That they turned from their evil way. Repenting from your sin is works. Look, it's a good thing to do. But it's works, and it has nothing to do with being saved. It has nothing to do with salvation. And then God changes his mind about what he's going to do. And we talked about that this morning. And he decided to not destroy the city. But then it says God repented. And we talked about, you know, repent just means to change your mind, folks. Repent means to change your mind. God changed his mind all the time in his management of us. Doesn't mean he made a mistake. It's just we have free will. God changed his mind according to whether we got right or not. That's what the Bible teaches. But the point is I'm trying to make this evening is turning from your sin or what people come and claim out there today. Look, this is a definition that's just been ruined. We must use the Bible as our dictionary. You know, repent just means to change your mind. Repenting from, from your sin or turning from your sin or getting sin out of your life is a work. It's a good work. I hope you all do it. It has nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven. Nothing. How about this one? Turn to Romans chapter 4. How about this one? So, repent of your sin is veiled works. You must repent of your sins to be saved. This is uh, Ray Comfort. This is Ray Comfort. When he goes around and he gives the gospel, and then he, gets to, he tells people how they're sinners, and look, that's the easy part. Most people realize just with their conscience that they're a sinner. All right? And then he tells them, oh, to be saved, you've got to repent from your sin. You've got to turn from your sin. It's a false gospel. He's accursed. It's a false gospel. It's works-based salvation. Turn to Romans chapter 4. How about this one? How about this one? Yeah, I, I believe it's only, only trusting on Jesus. It's only believing on Jesus. But if you're truly saved, you will do the works. Well, let's see if this is true. If you're truly saved, you will do the works. All right? Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse number 4. Let me tell you something. That's not true either. There's plenty of Christians out there doing nothing for the Lord. There's plenty of saved people out there doing nothing for the Lord. I'm not happy to report that to you, but that's the case. And they're not any less saved than you and I tonight. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse number 4. For the person that says this, this is the verse that you go to. In Romans chapter 4, verse number 4 and verse number 5, we're looking at two people. We're looking at two guys here. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 4. Now to him that worketh, now to him that worketh, now this is a guy doing good works. This is a guy, he's out there. He's going to church. He's very, you look at him and say, that guy's pretty religious. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of what? But of debt. To him that's out there and he's doing good works. He's out there and he's coming to church and he's, he seems spiritual and he's not into all kinds of sin, but he's trusting on that. He's going to have debt. That's what he's going to have. When he stands in front of Jesus, he's going to have a debt that he can't repay. He's the one that's going to say, Jesus said, I, 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 never, I never knew you. Like, just, I don't know who you are. Look at verse number five. Now here's another guy. So the guy in verse number four, he's doing good works. You might look at this guy and say, that's a nice guy. That's a nice Christian guy, people might say in verse number four. But look at verse number five. But to him that worketh not, this guy's a jerk. This guy's not doing any works. This guy, he's into all kinds of whatever. He's just not doing works at all. It, look, it doesn't say he worketh a little. The, the, the Bible's making a very clear contrast here. The guy in verse 4 worketh. The other guy worketh not. Speaking about good works. But look at the guy in verse 5. It says, but what? There's the two words. But this guy believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The guy in verse number five is going to heaven. He's a jerk. But what? He believeth on. He trusted on Jesus. He's not trusting in his own works. The guy that seems nice and seems religious in verse number four, he's trusting his own works. He's going to hell. 
because it has nothing to do with whether or not you will do the works. You should do the works. That's why in all through Romans, you see this, these wor this word. This is why like, we're King James only, by the way. You change one word in the Bible, you change salvation. Paul says again and again, you should do this. I should. I should do this. Yes, you're saved. You should get in church. You should listen to the Bible. You should learn what the Word of God has for your life. But you know what that means? It means it's all for how you will profit other people. It has nothing to do with your own salvation. Nothing. Not even a little bit. You know, people that are told this doctrine, people that are told this doctrine that, oh, if, if, if you're really saved, you will do the works. You know, look, they could be relying on that for their salvation. It's very dangerous to teach that, to believe that especially. The last one tonight. The last one tonight, and this, this is actually the one that I was hung up on before I got saved. The last one, turn to John chapter 10. The last one is this. We're talking about veiled works. We're talking about works-based salvation and how it can be veiled and intertwined with you know, the true gospel is the idea that you could lose your salvation. The idea that you could believeth on the Son, hath everlasting life, and then somehow that's taken away from you. If you don't go to church enough, or you don't... I, I shouldn't tell you this, right? I should tell you, you need to come to church. You need to come to church or you're going to go to hell. You need to give money in the offering or you're going to go to hell. Look, then we'd be a Pentecostal church. But that's not what the Bible says. That's a false gospel then we'd be a Catholic church. We are a Bible-based Baptist church. Once you are saved, it is everlasting life. You can never lose your salvation. Look at John chapter 10 and verse number 28. And there's so much Bible on this. It's, it's, it's so clear. It's a sermon in itself. But Jesus said these are red words as well. My favorite uh, verse to this is John chapter 10 and verse number 28. The Bible says, Jesus says, and I give. What do you give? You give a gift, by the way. And I give unto them eternal life. And when shall they go to hell? When shall they get the second death? I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Once you hath everlasting life, it's done. You will never, you have no chance ever that you will ever perish, ever get the second death. Neither, well, what if, what if somebody comes and teaches you something different, and you turn away from church, or you quit going to church, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. See, God is telling you here that when you get saved, this is why he says in Ephesians chapter 1 that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know who the Holy Spirit is? It's God. You know who keeps your salvation in his hand? God. You can't, you can't. I, I've seen it demonstrated where somebody brought up their child, a pastor brought up his child and said, you know, because a lot of people say, oh yeah, but you can turn away from God. And they bring up their child, and they, you know, a strong pastor is holding his child's hand and said, all right, son, get away from me. Look, you're not strong enough to get out of God's hand. Once you are saved, you are always saved. Because guess what? Believe, just think of the logic of it again. Believing that you have to work to stay saved is no different than believing you have to work to get saved. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God, and guess what? If God told you that something was a gift and it was eternal, and then he takes it away for any reason, that's not truthful. But in Titus 1, 2, it says, in hope of eternal life. This is in hope of eternal life, meaning here's how you can know it's eternal, which God that cannot lie. There's only one thing in the Bible God says he can't do. Imagine God created the whole universe. He created you. He created me. He could do anything except lie. He can't lie. So when he tells you that it's eternal, that it's everlasting, that you're sealed, that he holds it, it's true because he can't lie. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Here's some more logic for you. Look, it's just, it's the only way that salvation by grace through faith is the only thing that makes any sense. It's the only thing that makes any sense. I mean, how many times have I just said, think about it logically? Think about it logically. Think about this logically. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, 
So he's talking about people that are saved. Who are, who are people that believed on the name of the Son of God? These are people that have trusted on Jesus. He's saying, I've written this to you. Why? Why? Why, God? Why did you write this? That ye may know that ye have eternal life. Did he say, did he say uh, that you may think you might have it? He said, no. I'm writing these things to you so you know it. Now let me ask you this. If you could lose it, if it was possible for you to lose it, first of all, if it was possible for any of us to lose it, we'd lose it. But second of all, if you could, if you could possibly lose it, could you ever know that you really had it? Don't you and I sin every day? Don't you and I slip up? Or don't we have the flesh, the Bible says, that's going to be with us until my heart stops beating? You could, if you could ever lose it through your works, you could never know that you have it. And this is what got me. This is what got me when I was thinking about these things before anybody had ever given me the gospel, because I didn't know. I was going to church. I was trying to read the Bible. I was trying to do these things, but I was like, man, I don't know. I don't know because I'm messing up all the time here. And I know I'm going to church and I'm confessing my sins, as 1 John 1, 9 says I should. And I know that I'm, but sometimes when I confess my sins, I know I'm going to do those sins again. Am I, am I really thinking that I'm fooling God? I didn't know. The only way to know is if it's only through trusting on Jesus, and once you have it, you can never lose it. That's the only way. There's no list of sins in the Bible that says you can... Look, if there's a list, if, there's, if there is sins that can cause me to lose my salvation, I need a chart. I need an Excel spreadsheet. I need something that says you can do this many sins of this much, uh, you know, of, the, of these varying degrees in this period, and it needs to be over time. There's nothing like that in the Bible. And the reason that there isn't because it has nothing to do with your works to get saved. It has nothing to do with your works to stay saved. You can know that you're saved, and the only way you can know is it because once you trust it, in a moment you have it. And you, that's done. It's it. And God, look, God will chastise you on this earth, but he'll never take away your salvation. You can't tell people that. You can't tell people they can do whatever they want. Hey, go to Hebrews chapter 12 if you want to be chastised and beaten by God. But you're not going to lose your salvation. You're not going to, be lose, you're not going to lose your salvation. You become a child of God. God adopts you into his family. And look, God's a good father. He's going to chastise his children, but you will never stop being his son. Just like your child, your child may mess up, and if you're a good father, you'll punish that child. That child grows up to be a wicked kid. You may kick them out of your house one day, but they will never stop being your son. That's exactly how it works. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 7 says, If ye endure chastening, meaning if God is beating you, God dealeth with you as sons, lowercase s. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof ye are all partakers... You be bastards and not sons. This is why you see so many people out there that are not saved that seem like they're getting away with stuff. I mean, that's a big question too. I'll, I'll deal with that in another sermon. But that's a big question to have is why, why are all these evil, wicked people able to get away with all these things? Why are they able to go out and do all these things and it doesn't seem like God cares? Because he's going to burn them in hell for eternity. That's why. No vengeance that we could ever come up with on this earth could ever compare to what God is going to do to these wicked, evil people that murder people, that hurt children, you know, or whatever. God says vengeance is mine. The reason he says that is because, look, he's, he's like, you know what? Let me handle it. It's like, I got this. But look, he's going to chastise us as believers in this body on this earth. King Saul... Saved at a young age, became a wicked king, murdered priests. God sent an army against him. He saw the army. He, he committed suicide. 1 Samuel chapter 28 says he's in heaven. God killed him. God got so tired of that believer that he's like, I'm done with you. I'm taking you off this earth. But God can't lie. He will never take away our salvation. It's a promise. 
It's a promise. Look, here's the irony. As a soul winner, you'll see this. As you get to become an a experienced person out there, just seeing the soul winner out there, had, there is no better person that has their pulse on our current society than somebody that is out there sharing the gospel with people. It is one of the biggest benefits, in my opinion, of, of, of being a soul winner. You, just, you see the state of our communities, of our country, of our states, of other parts of the world. If you become a soul winner here, we're going to send you all over. But look, people, here, here's the irony that you will see. The more people believe in works, it's just, it's just a trend. I notice trends. The more people believe in works to justify themselves, the more wicked of a person they are. It's just a trend that I've noticed. And I was like, this must be in the Bible somewhere. And I was thinking about it. And sure enough, turn to Job chapter 9. Turn to Job chapter 9. Everyone, because guess what? This is the trap of works-based salvation is everyone thinks they're pretty good. I'm sure Hitler thought he was pretty good. I'm sure Stalin thought he was doing the right thing or, you know, doing, you know, I, I'm pretty sure when he sat at the end of the day, these evil, most wicked people that have ever lived have, have thought they were pretty good. But look at Job chapter 9 and verse number 20. Job, a very godly man, a very godly man who passed this, this amazing test from the Lord. God just allowed his life to be crushed allowed everything to be taken from him. He never one time blamed God. Look what he says in verse number 20. He says, if I justify myself, isn't that what these people are doing? Isn't that what anyone that believes in works-based salvation or any combination of the things that we're doing? Like, I can be good enough. I can get good enough to cover up my sins. Look, you're justifying yourself. He says, Job says, if I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Isn't that interesting? The more perfect someone, you ever met somebody who, who, who I, a few times I've met somebody that says I've never sinned. <laughs> I've, met, I've met that person. But look, that is a perverse person, the Bible says. That says that I have never sinned, that I am pretty good, that I'm going to justify myself through my works. This is why the more people believe they can justify themselves, the worse people they actually tend to be. And you'll see that. You'll see that. That's just a, a side note for you. But all that to say this, folks, just to conclude tonight, any, addi any addition of works to the gospel is a different gospel. That's what you need to understand. And the Bible says in Galatians 1, verse 8 and verse 9, twice, it says anybody preaching a different gospel is accursed, meaning damned. It's very serious. So here's what I do to these people. Here's what you should do out soul winning. You should ask people if they know if they're going to heaven as we ask that question. But let them tell you in their own words. Let me ask you, if I was, if I was your friend, you know, what would you tell me it takes to get to heaven? Ask them and then listen to their own words and hit record. Because a lot of these people are so twisted around the axle, it's very difficult for you to even tell them the truth and then to realize there's a difference in what you're saying. So just ask them, if I was your friend, what would you tell me it takes to get to heaven? And then just listen to what they say. And then I will usually say to those people, if I can show you from the Bible how the Bible says something different, would you be interested in hearing? And then what you can do is when you get to these verses that you're going to use to show them what the Bible actually teaches, you can use their own words. Do you see how that's different than repent of your sins? Do you see how that's different from what you told me at the door, from what you told me at the beginning. And we go and you use Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 11, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 5, all these different verses, Isaiah chapter 64, Matthew chapter 7, when you use all these verses to show them. And look, this is why we carry a Bible out there soul winning. We carry a Bible because it's God's words that have power, not ours. You know, it's, it's not me trying to come out and just convince people, you know, of something that I came up with. No, I'm using God's words. They have power. I am nothing. My words are nothing. But look, some people, they're so wrapped around the axle, they're, they're not, you're gonna, it's going to be hard to untwist them. But if you find somebody that truly wants to know the truth, they will listen. And the Bible has power, and it will show them. But look, here's the point, folks. Here's why works is the biggest stumbling block that we will run into out there. Why? Why? Because it's from Satan. That's why. Because works-based salvation is Satan's religion. 
There's only two religions in the whole world. You say, what are you talking about? You're crazy. There's two religions in the whole world. You say, what? There's thousands. No, there's two. There's religions that teach that you justify yourself, as Job said. That's every, think of it. That's Mormons, that's Catholics, it's Buddhists, it's Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Jews. Name a religion, and then there's what the, it's, it's all different forms of working your way to heaven. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you can't do that. It's all different forms of works based salvation, justifying yourself. And then there's what the Bible says that it's through grace, and Jesus did it all, and all you have to do is trust on that. That's it. Two religions in the whole world. The works-based religions, all of them are designed. Look, you can tell, you can tell like if, if somebody's designed a, a, a bridge or a, a factory or something, you can tell if it's the same designer that's designed a bunch of different machines because they tend to come at it the same way. The works-based salvation is definitely designed by Satan because they all have that same characteristics that is trying, that, that those religions are trying to get you to justify yourself. And those religions are going to send you to hell. Why? Because what does Satan, what is Satan's main philosophy? In Isaiah 14, what does he say? What does Satan say in Isaiah 14? He says, I will be like the Most High. Works-based salvation is trying to get you to claim credit for something that only God can do. It's trying to get you to say, every single person that you come to the door, you say, do you know if you're going to go to heaven? Yeah, I'm pretty good. You know what they just said? I'm like the Most High. Only Jesus Christ can justify us. Only Jesus Christ can justify any person in the world that has ever lived. Only Jesus Christ. And if we say, I can do it myself, I'm saying, I am like the Most High. And you know who said that? Satan said that. I'm trying to arm you with the truth tonight so you can go out and you can pull these people. You can pull these people to the truth. And look, if you find somebody that wants to know the truth, they will listen to this because it makes perfect sense and God's word has power. It's not of works, folks, not a little bit. That is Satan's religion. Thank God for the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.